Hala wa sala and shalom from Jerusalem. This is Al Shak al Ausad Lana, our Middle East, where we look at the Middle East from the inside out. And uh, boy, the big question today how big is the gulf between the Gulf states and Israel? All kinds of confusing messages. The Saudi Iranian re engagement, different confusing signals from the Abraham Accord members. What is really going on behind the scenes across the Middle East? I'm very privileged and honored to have today Dr. Yechiel Leiter, Director General of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, Middle East expert, political theorist, just came back from the Gulf. And what Yechiel uh, told me just before we went on air, he said, Dan, it's tough to play chess in a region that's playing checkers. And the question is, what does it mean to play chess in this changing, shifting Middle East where there are no sure messages, Yechiel, and a lot of really uh, 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 a lot of confusion coming out of this region. What's your sense? Well, Dan, first of all, I'm delighted to be here with you um, and, uh, and share some ideas. Uh, the distance between the Gulf and Israel is the same distance. The only dis the difference is that now we can fly over the skies of Saudi Arabia. So, uh, you know, let's take uh, into account uh, the, the changes that have already taken place on the ground that are bridging the gap or the Gulf. Uh, but it's important when you talk about chess and checkers, you know, in personal relationships, we very often find people in conversations saying one thing and meaning something else. Uh, that happens in social dynamics, but in politics and in international relations, it's the mainstay. It's the biggest part of the game. Um, you you uh, use the art of obfusc obfuscation many times in order to, to politic, in order to uh, send messages to one state or another. Uh, so when we find uh, contradiction in terms or contradictions in policy, what appear to be contradictions, we have to penetrate a little bit more. You know, sometimes uh, you mentioned chess and checkers. We interpret politics very often as a chessboard. We're moving in one direction. Everybody's doing the same thing. But uh, the Middle East in particular is a game of checkers. Uh, and, you know, a, check, a, a checkmate can, can, uh, can, can flip to the other side very quickly with one very adept move. So when we see the Saudi rapprochement with Iran, we immediately assume that the Saudis have left the Abraham Accord orbit or are down on the notion of normalizing relations with Israel. But that's not necessarily the case at all, and that's what we have to try to understand. I want to uh, I want to pick up on that point because you wrote a very far-reaching um, piece uh, analysis on the Jerusalem Center uh, for Public Affairs website jcpa.org, in which you argue and 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 you had actually consulted with a number of people in the Gulf on this concept uh, that there is no contradiction intended between. A, what they call the return to diplomatic relations between Saudi and the Islamic Republic of Iran and Saudi's still on track relationship uh, with uh, with Israel, whether it ends up normalizing today, tomorrow or next month, we don't know. But your point was no contradiction intended. Not necessarily intended. This is an analysis. Um, it's very difficult. I think it's incorrect to speak uh, regarding international relations in indefinites. Uh, it, it is possible. It's conceivable. We have to entertain all possibilities. I mean, we ask one basic question. The Saudis are opposed to Iran having nuclear weapons. Has the rapprochement changed that? It hasn't. So what is Saudi's game then of, uh, uh, of, of reaching this agreement, kind of this under-the-table agreement, not formal yet. It's just between the heads of their uh, national security services. You know, the foreign ministers haven't signed this. The leaders of the country haven't signed this yet. It's still conditional. But the Saudis have a lot of things in mind, not necessarily uh, Israel. And uh, be before we analyze that, the most important point to make is that 
the, the basic mistake that's being made repeatedly, both uh, by Israelis and, and some of our uh, American supporters, this is not a, a, an extension of the Abraham Accords. An agreement with Saudi Arabia or any sort of normalization with Saudi Arabia is an epic journey. This is not another country, just another country making peace with Israel. The Saudis were saying, we are follow we're leaders, not followers. Yeah, they're, they're not following Bahrain and the UAE, with all due respect to those two important countries, or, or Morocco or Sudan. Uh, Saudi Arabia is the leader, uh, certainly in their eyes, of the not only the Arab world, but the Muslim world, with uh, being the uh, um, uh, in charge, the center, the epicenter of, of Islam in Mecca and Medina and so on. So normalization with Saudi Arabia, a peace agreement with Saudi Arabia, is something far beyond uh, anything that's happened to date. And it will probably bring into the fold countries like Pakistan, like Indonesia, huge Muslim countries uh, that would find it very difficult to remain outside the orbit of peace were Saudi Arabia to join uh, the uh, peace accords with Israel. Now, that's the first point. The second point is that... Uh, there's a big difference between, you know, White House ceremonies and normalization. And we make a mistake if we push too hard to immediately see White House signings with presidents, prime ministers, kings and princes, uh, you know, all sharing cocktails and then going out to meet the press and embrace and so on. That's nice. And that may ultimately happen. But what's more important is a functional functional normalization. And normalization can happen at gradual stages, incremental stages, without necessarily having formal peace signed. And that's where our focus should be right now. Uh, engaging the Saudis on every level, ideational, practical, activational, security-wise, and so on. The third point, and this is the main point on the chessboard of the Middle East, uh, you know, the kingpin has left the board. The United States uh, you know, balanced power in the region. It was the really the sole balancer of power. Uh, since oil was discovered in the middle of the, uh, near the middle of the 20th century, and whether we, we're talking about progressive Democrats or isolationist Republicans, the United States is stepping back. It has reduced forces in the Gulf dramatically from where it was a decade ago. Uh, and it's making it very clear whether we're talking about uh, Obama's red line in Syria, which was crossed uh, but uh, had, had engendered no response, or we're talking about the Americans turning off the Patriot batteries when missiles were fired from Iran uh, into, uh, into the Gulf, into Saudi Arabia, uh, whether it's their uh, hands-off, laissez-faire approach to the proxy wars that Iran is uh, uh, initiating and, and, and managing throughout the region, whether it's in Iraq, uh, whether it's in uh, Yemen, in Syria, uh, destabilization all around Israel, uh, the octopus of Iran uh, through Hamas in the south and Hezbollah in the north, and the attempt to radicalize the Palestinian Arabs in uh, Judea and Samaria. So uh, uh, Saudi Arabia looks around and says, can I really rely on the United States to ensure that uh, Iran doesn't threaten our existence? Now, people make the mistake of thinking that the threat from Iran is only if it actually achieves and uses nuclear power. But the, the threat from Iran, an existential threat from Iran, doesn't only come from its actual uh, 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 deployment it's also, deter weapons. it's also deterrent capability. Well, right? well, well, it, it, yeah, it, it deterrent capability in the sense that managing proxy wars against Iran without nuclear power and managing proxy wars against Iran with nuclear power is a completely different opera. Um, and if Iran achieves nuclear power tomorrow, then the potency of the Houthis in Yemen to topple that government completely, take over those critical waterways for international transport and threaten the longest border of Saudi Arabia in the south, uh, so threaten Saudi Arabia's uh, sovereignty, grows exponentially. The ability for Iran then to uh, completely take over Iraq, 
uh, functionally, not only uh, 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 for, uh, formally as well as functionally, is there um, and 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 to empower all the enemies of Israel to actually unleash uh, the the uh, the hundreds of thousands of missiles between the Hezbollah and the Hamas that we'd have to confront uh, becomes uh, that much greater exponentially. So Saudi Arabia is committed to finding a way to preventing Iran from achieving uh, nuclear uh, power. And if they have to pivot, you know, a kind of Nixon pivot to China, well, now Saudi Arabia is pivoting to China. And, and they're saying, well, look, you know, if I can bring in, and this was the, the thesis of the, of the analysis, is that uh, Saudi Arabia begins to uh, pour money into Iran together with China it then becomes pretty much in short order. I mean, the, the Iranians are suffering uh, uh, terribly. The Iranian people are suffering under these ayatollahs in, in the worst way. We're talking about food shortages. We're talking about fuel shortages. We're talking about massive malnutrition. We're talking about real human suffering. And um, the, 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 um, uh, uh, the promise of uh, massive funding into Iran could potentially um, empower Iranians more than they've been empowered until. You mean from a public as a public as a public as a public to rise up in a much more potent and forceful way mm -hmm. to to topple the government and you know of course Dan we've discussed this many times at the center. We th there's no issue that the West has with the Iranian people. the The issue is with the Ayatollah's regime. Right. Uh, you know you, you you just you just came back too from London and you had a an amazing meeting there. Perhaps you you you'd like to share a, a word on that with. Uh, Iranian dissidents, uh, one who is, um, uh, has been on a hunger strike for some 72 days and his wife is like an Avital Sharansky, you know, going around the world speaking on his behalf. And the objective, which, which we also together hope to uh, take part in, in in uniting the Iranian opposition, uh, very, very important, very, very important. And, and, and so Saudi Arabia may be thinking, maybe thinking, that at the same time, where we're gradually normalizing relations with Israel, I mean, just think about it. The functional rapprochement with Israel has been going on longer than it's been going on with Iran, and they haven't put a stop to it. So while it appears contradictory, it actually can uh, uh, complement uh, each other, both, both tracks that the Saudis are pursuing. And it could just be, and this is highly probable, that the pivot to China is actually intended to repivot, to have the United States repivot. I mean, the United States policy is, is really just mind-boggling. They've left the Middle East. The United States has left the Middle East for China, so China has replaced the United States in the Middle East. Whereas the United States still says that China is the United States' primary advers adversary. When you look at it in a global po political economic standpoint, and in fact, what's interesting about what you say, Yehiel, is that Israel, in a sense, um, pivoted has pivoted to China for some years economically in the sense that China is an owner of some of uh, Israel's uh, greatest uh, national assets, uh, you know, whether it's a port uh, in Haifa. Or... Well, they, op they operate, yeah, they won the tender, but that was a fair uh, tender that the Chinese uh, uh, won. And um, the, the, it was an open market tender. I mean, there were many competitors and there's no reason why we should have kept the, the Chinese out if they won the tender fair and square. The question is, is in your analogy, in your chess analogy, if the king, the United States, has left the board, who is the queen? Is it Russia or is it China? Well, look, there's, there's, uh, there, there are a lot of rooks running around. I, I, don't, I don't think anybody has completely replaced uh, the United States yet, and there's still hope. I mean, look, all of this has much to do with the populism that's running around the United States today whether it be particularly on the left, but also on the right as well. Um, you know, uh, uh, with the progressives uh, uh, pulling at fossil fuels, you know, uh, and, and um, uh, encouraging the belief that somehow some miracle will happen and by 2030, you know, we'll be free of fossil fuels, which is ludicrous in its own, in its own right. Um, uh, so, you know, so, the, so, so the, the foreign policy is then translated into one which says we don't need the Gulf Petroleum. We don't need oil from the Gulf anymore. Uh, and therefore, it's not strategically important. So first of all, you're going to need the oil from the Gulf for many, many years uh, to come. Secondly, the strategic importance of the Gulf is not only 
uh, oil. Uh, this is, you know, this this is like like our uh, symbol of the JCPA indicates. This is really the center of three continents. We sit at the nexus of uh, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Uh, so, so the Middle East is of critical import. This is where radical Islam is being exported from. This is where the destabilization of African countries is coming from. This is where the uh, destabilization and, and failed states uh, around the world is coming from. Uh, Iran has hegemonic interests, and it is an evil, I don't say it's empire, it's not empire yet, but it's, an, it's, a, it's a bad actor, a bad, bad actor. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, destabilization and failed states is what it exports. So we, we need a power here. Just one, one more point that I would make on that track is, you know, the, the world order for the past, uh, well, ever since, you know, uh, Bretton Woods and the, the, the post-World War II order is that the United States protects uh, sea transport. I mean, think about it. Today, everything is so compartmentalized. Uh, everything you build anywhere in the world, the components come from dozens of countries and it reaches the, it, its destination through sea transport. Now, if we just take one little neighborhood in our neck of the woods called the Red Sea and the Suez Canal, and we take into account that 40% of European imports come through the Red Sea, and sitting there on the Red Sea, bordering the Red Sea, uh, on the west uh, side is Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Okay, on the east side, we've got Egypt, Sudan, Eritrea, Ethiopia is almost there, uh, and uh, uh, Somalia, uh, Djibouti, of course. Um, and, you know, if, if stability, if that, if that area were to be threatened, let's say through the instability in Sudan, the civil war going on there right now, which Iran has a hand in, or the uh, radical Islam threatening the stability of Somalia, which Iran has a hand in. Uh, if, if Yemen were to fall to the Houthis, Iran, once again, we're talking about a threat to uh, a large chunk of world trade. So we're talking about the world economy, some 13% of petroleum imports and exports come through the Suez Canal. So uh, the, the United States needs to be here uh, not just because it needs the oil imported from the Gulf to the U.S. Uh, it needs to be here because this is an epicenter of stability or instability uh, of, of the export of either the illnesses, the bad ideas of Iran or the productive moderate ideas coming out of Israel and the UAE. I mean, you know, you, you talk about just one last point, I'm sorry. It, you know, you, you, the, the, it's fascinating holding these conversations with people in the Gulf of, to, to, to witness the, the tensions, the social, ideational, ideological tensions going on within the Arab community um, and its interpretation of Islam. Uh, and it, this is really a, you know, the Islamic world never underwent a reformation. You know, we didn't have, they didn't have their Martin Luther. Uh, and um, its confrontation with modernity uh, is still being reconciled, not to mention postmodernity. So there are very intense uh, sociological and uh, ideological trends that are competing with each other in the Gulf. And I think that's one of the main reasons why the young generation is very much looking towards Israel where we have this mosaic in our society, despite all of the bad propaganda we get around the world, this is a tremendous mosaic society. The people who we brought to our conference just, you know, two months ago, uh, you know, 30 odd countries from Africa and, and, and the Arab world, many of which don't have relations with Israel even, uh, you know, they, they just couldn't believe that, you know, they, they walk out of the hotel and there's all sorts of people, Jews and non-Jews, Arabs and, and, and Christians and, and Muslims and Christians, uh, the free access to the Temple Mount where they, they, they all thought that, you know, they'd, they'd be uh, uh, held up by Israeli security forces. It would take them hours to get in and they'd be searched. And everyone came back to the hotel, if you remember, and said, gee, it just walks straight in. I mean, the free access is unbelievable. There wasn't free access like this under other rulers, you know. Uh, under co other countries, other sovereignties. 
So um, uh, I think a lot of this ideological um, uh, tension going on within the Arab world is part of the reason why they're turning to Israel today and saying, you know, how, what, how do you guys do it? And remember, you know, your ancestors lived with us. You know, you didn't all come from Poland or Germany, right? I mean, you used to live in Baghdad. You were a, a large percentage of the population in Baghdad. You were a large percentage of the population in Yemen. We still have the old shul in, in Bahrain, you know? I mean, Jews lived in the region for, for you know, since the time of the Babylonian Talmud, uh, after the destruction of the Second Temple. So, I mean, there's a, there's a long, long presence here. And, there, and some of them, the young generation, is saying, well, just a second, you know, maybe uh, it's better for us and for the entire region if we just cool things down and, and just get along, uh, normalize things, even if there aren't all sorts of treaties which make people a little uncomfortable. You know, it's interesting, you're feeling, you're listening to your uh, regional analysis, it, it reminds me of how important uh, our working uh, definition of what Israel is at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, which is an indigenous minority member of a Muslim-majority Middle East. But indigenous is the key word, and that when you go to the Gulf, uh, when I, or the some of the conversations that, that I've had in London with some uh, uh, friends uh, from the region, that we, we present ourselves uh, as uh, what they say, begove naim, as they say in Hebrew, you know, eye to eye, as a, a fellow indigenous member of the Middle East. We actually are the older brother, the older sister, if you were, been here over 3,500 years. Um, and, and I think that, that um, perhaps our, um, uh, our, our co-regionalists, if you will, ha are, are beginning to understand that Israel has a different, a, a different um, narrative about itself, which is a fact-based narrative, and that, that our relations, as you talk about people-to-people, -people, civil society, civil society, intellectual, ideational, um, go much, much deeper historically and even intellectually than we've ever had before, which is why uh, you and I have, have talked for a long time about uh, you know, really launching this initiative, a communication center initiative at the Jerusalem Center, where we we build in this type of dialogue. The type of dialogue we've had here for the last 25 minutes or so is not found in in Israel's normal relations uh, with, th that are quite transactional with the uh, Abraham Accord countries. And certainly our security-based relations, um, you know, fighting terrorism opposite the Palestinian Authority, the PLO, Fatah, Hamas, PIJ, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and everyone else. So this is kind of like a new repositioning of Israel's uh, place, its rightful place, in in ancient region. And here we are as an ancient people speaking in in that idiom with our uh, with our let's say our our Arab Muslim cousins. I'll share with you two anecdotes from this past Shabbat. You know, it's um, in the Gulf. In the Gulf, yeah. yeah you know, it's you can't make this stuff up. Uh, you, you know, you you sit at the Chabad house in Dubai having Shabbat dinner with yeah. 180 uh, Israelis and, and Jewish visitors from around the world. And uh, I invited an, an Egyptian friend uh, to have a Shabbat meal uh, at Chabad in Dubai. Uh, Can't make it up. And, and he, he um, and this gets back to the beginning of our conversation when I said we have to learn to live with contra what appears to be contradictions. You know, so he began the conversation by saying, well, you know, look... Why can't you just get over, get it over with, with the Palestinians? I mean, you know, we're threatened too by all sorts of uh, radicals and so on. So he says, you know, come on, you're the powerful, you're the powerful entity. Just sit down and get it over with, you know. And I, I said to him, listen, um, how did uh, your president deal with the revolution of the Muslim Brotherhood? Did he just get it over with? Yep, he brought in the army. He said, could we do 10% with our army? What the Egyptians will do uh, in, in, with, with their army, with those people threatening the, the government, you have an autocratic regime. So I guess if we had autocracy, if we, you know, he even called his own government quasi-fascist, okay? I said, so do you, and he said, you know, he smiled and said, you're, you're right. I guess you can't really do, if you want to really be a democracy, what, what we would do in Egypt or elsewhere. The other, the other anecdote is sitting with a noted Saudi journalist in Abu Dhabi. And uh, he's talking to me about the importance of producing, listen to this, producing documentaries 
which prove the belonging, uh, the indigenousness, as you say, of uh, uh, of the Jewish people to the Temple Mount. I said, I know everything you hear is that uh, criticism about the not giving free access to the to the Muslims and so on and so forth. He says, we know that that's nonsense. You know, there's free access, but uh, um, and you, we know that you don't interfere. But the problem is, he says, the forty million Saudis don't know. They don't know that there was a temple of Solomon on the Temple Mount and that Jews all over the world for 3,000 years faced the Temple Mount. They don't know that. They don't know that when when Jews lived in this region, they turned to the, to the West. Jews in Ashkenaz turned to the East. They don't understand the centrality of Jerusalem to the Jewish experience. He said, please produce... Uh, uh, documentaries, simple documentaries, not selling a political idea, uh, but just of of the belonging, the sense of belonging that the Jews, Jews have with Jerusalem. And he said, do it in Arabic. And do it in Arabic. We want to broadcast it on social media today. Yeah. One of the blessings of social media is that you don't need millions and millions. You don't have to compete with Al Jazeera with a television station, but you can compete with social media. And, uh, and, and, and we uh, certainly have a uh, responsibility to follow through on things like that because it's that's that's normalization. This gets back to what we were talking about before. We don't need a peace treaty to do that. We can we can create normalization on a day to day, hour to hour basis tomorrow, even with limited funds. Get that message out there. We talk about you know we have a Palestinian accountability program at the JCPA, right? Much of these people are fed up with having given billions and billions to Palestinian corruption. He said to me document it. Let's document it in Arabic and send it out on social media. Now, this is a Saudi telling me this from the JCPA sitting in Abu Dhabi. So I think we have a tremendous responsibility to follow through on this kind of activity. Absolutely, uh, Yechiel Leiter. And I think your, 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 uh, the depth of your, your insights and your, your commentary is particularly important at this time when we're really trying to develop what we call this this people-to-people, intellect-to-intellect uh, dialogue in the region uh, and to get Israel away from this uh, false uh, uh, propagandistic uh, approach to Israel as, you know, Israel and the Palestinians, yes or no, you know, if, if now or when or why. And here we are having a much deeper regional conversation that begins several thousand years ago, comes to the present day, and is all um, it is all really centered around a chessboard that is the the largest chessboard in the world called the Middle East. I, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Yechiel Leiter, political theorist, political theorist, Middle East expert, and director general of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. I'll very much look forward to having these conversations without the microphone, with the microphone, as we move forward with our Arab partners in a major communication uh, initiative as well as diplomatic and security initiatives that that uh, are very much wanting, and we've been asked to partner with them. So we're really looking at a very exciting and, as you say, important and urgent time. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Enjoying. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Dan. And um, by all means, let's play chess. Let's we play got, chess. We play, play chess to win, but let's play chess. We certainly do, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm honored and privileged to have you as, as a partner in this chess game. I couldn't think of a, a person uh, who's more skilled to be able to move the board. So mm-hmm. thank you very much. This is Al Shaka Al Savlana, our Middle East. I'm Dan Diker. Thanks for joining us. Uh, please join us again uh, soon. We're going to talk about what is going on with the Arab League.